now, man. Welcome to the HPC Best Practices uh, webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the XA Scale Computing Project of the US Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I'll be the host for today's webinar, evaluating performance portability of HPC applications and benchmarks across diverse HPC architectures. The webinar will be presented by Jay Huk Kwok. Jay Huk is a member of the Performance Engineering Group at the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility where uh, he is responsible for ensuring the readiness of several major scientific applications on the forthcoming Aurora XA scale system. He received a bachelor and a master in engineering from Seoul a National University in South Korea, and a PhD in computational mechanics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Before joining Argonne, he worked in the Blue Waters Project at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications there in uh, Illinois. We have issued uh, more than 200 tickets for today's webinar and all attendees have been muted. Let's see how many people show up. People change plans and uh, other things. We'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. I'll be paying attention to, to those. Uh, I'll paste those addresses in the chat momentarily. Uh, we have asked Jay Hook to add, uh, add breaks during his presentation so he can respond to questions that come in. And with that, I'll stop my sharing. Jay Hook, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Osni, for the introduction. And uh, let me start my video and share my screen. Okay, so, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jay Hyuk uh, I'm going to talk about evaluating performance portability of HPC applications and benchmarks across diverse HPC architecture. Uh, though I present this work, this work was done by myself and my colleague, uh, Colin Bertoni, Yasman Gadar, Thomas Eppercourt, and Hiro Jen, John Tram, Brian Homerding, uh, Steve Rangel, Chris Knight, and Scott Parker. All of us uh, made some uh, contribution, our own contribution for this work. Okay, so today, uh, this is a key overview of uh, my talk uh, today. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the HPC architecture over time very quickly. And then I'm gonna share our uh, early work for the performance study in around happened in 2018, 2019 timeframe. And then I will move on our most recent study, which is uh, about performance portability on AMD and Intel and NVIDIA GPU system was done in 2021 timeframe. Okay, so I just uh, picked several years to check what kind of HPC architecture we have. So I chose the 2015 as a parascale error. So in 2015, we have several tens of uh, 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 the parascale, uh, parascale system in, in, in top 500. So in 2015 timeframe, uh, we can see uh, several different architecture, but if you check the data, around 15% uh, of performance uh, came from the GPU accelerated system in 2015 timeframe. So, in this, uh, in, in this time frame, uh, most of users are just thinking the CPU as the primary vendor, the primary architecture, and the, some uh, users use the GPU architecture for best performance. And I also chose uh, 2018 as a pre access scale error. In 2018, we have uh, several hundred parascale systems in, in top 500, including some in the Sierra. So in, the, in 2018 timeframe, if we check how much performance coming from uh, GPU, we got around 18% performance uh, came from GPU system on the top 500 list. And then I chose 2021 as almost exascale error because last year uh, we had a half exascale system on the top 500 list. So I, I would say we, are, we were not at the exascale error yet, but uh, we are almost at exascale error. In 2021, if we check uh, the performance from GPU, uh, we can see the GPU uh, performance portion become twice more than the three years ago. So around 38% of performance came from GPU in 2021 timeframe. And then uh, we are curious what, what, what happened in the exascale error, right? It will happen soon because we know several uh, HP centers are developing exascale system and they will be uh, open, they will, 
will be deployed soon or already deployed, right? So we can get a hint from the USDOE roadmap exascale system uh, slide, uh, what's going on on the exascale error, right? So as you see here, in 2021 to 2023 timeframe, uh, USDOE uh, plan to deploy the several of uh, the GPU accelerator system. So for example, the Aurora system will be exascale system based on Intel GPU and the Perlmutter uh, Frontier will be the AMD GPU-based um, exascale system and El Capitan will be another AMD-based GPU system. And you also have the very powerful pre-exascale system per motor from the Buckley lab, which is based on the NVIDIA GPU and AMD CPU. So on the exascale error, we expect more GPU exascale system uh, we will have, right? So, and what are you looking for? So. Uh, most application developers would like to have one program, programming model that, that would run everywhere, right? So which means portability. And uh, they want to get the uh, decent performance across the everywhere, so which is the performance portability. And then they just want to focus on their scientific and engineering project to get some achievement, which means productivity, right? But unfortunately, unfortunately I think uh, you don't have it yet. So this talk is about our effort to explore the past and the current state of the things in terms of basic portability for the pro programming models and how to evaluate performance across different architecture and how to approach the how to approach understanding the performance portability. So let me move on our first uh, part of this talk, so which is a performance study uh, done in 2018. In 2018 timeframe, as I showed in the previous slide, we have around 80% of performance coming from, came from, coming from CPU-based uh, system. So we have uh, many different CPU, we chose the many different CPU uh, architecture, and we also included uh, one of the most powerful GPU in 2018 timeframe. And this work was done by me and Thomas, Colin, Yassi, Fiho, and Chris and Scott, and it was presented at the Cray user group meeting early 2019. So this is, the, this is the employed architecture uh, in 2018 timeframe. So we use uh, Geo, Intel Geom5 KNL processor as the kind of reference processor. So in 2018, KNL was kind of outdated architecture, but we used uh, it as a reference. And we chose the uh, Intel Geom Scarlet processor. It was uh, one of the most powerful processor uh, in 2018 timeframe. And it has uh, 28 cores, x86 based core, and each core has two, AVX 512 FMA units, its backup length is 512 bit, which is very long. And the third architecture we chose was uh, ARM Thunder X2 processor. So in 2018, we heard uh, the Recan was building uh, ARM based supercomputer, and now we have it. So in 2018 timeframe, we were curious about uh, uh, the, how much performance you can get on, from the uh, ARM ecosystem. So we chose ARM Thunder X2 processor as a proxy a processor uh, for that ARM ecosystem. So ARM Thunder X2 had uh, the same number of, number, number of cores uh, as the, the Skylake, so 28 cores, and each core has two Neon 120 vector engine. So compared to ABX, uh, the, the Skylake processor, its vector length was uh, one fourth, but the number of FM and unit and number of cores are the same and the similar uh, frequency. The last one was the, one of the most powerful GPU in 2018, so which is NVIDIA B100 GPU. And we tested, uh, and then we used um, uh, two ECP benchmark and four ECP application uh, to check what is performance uh, we, we can get. So uh, first one is HP GMG, uh, which is um, ECP Pax application. And this benchmark used uh, full multi-grid F cycle uh, approach. So in this uh, diagram, you can see uh, some typical B cycle and the F cycle has uh, progressively uh, deeper uh, B cycle for, to solve the problem. And uh, to run this application on the multiple architecture, we use NPF plus OpenMP for CPU side and NPF plus CUDA for the GPU side. Uh, Macbone is another mini app uh, from the NEC 5000 CFD code. And uh, at, in 2018 timeframe, we didn't have GPU ports, so we just used NPA plus OpenMP for the CPU uh, the, the benchmarking. 
And GAMES is ECP application for quantum chemistry. And it has a lot of different uh, complex algorithms. And uh, in this study, we use MPA plus OpenMP for CPU and MPA plus uh, CUDA for GPU uh, uh, evaluation. And LEMS is another ECP uh, uh, application for the molecular simulation. And uh, for CPU, we use MPA plus OpenMP and GPU, we use MPA plus COCOS implementation. And QMC PEG is uh, ECP application for electronic structure calculation. And uh, we use the late, latest version in 2018 timeframe, which is uh, QMC PEG 3.7 with SOA optimization. We have some details later, but, and we use this version and uh, this is uh, the input we used. And the last application is QBOX, which is for the plane wave uh, density functional theory. And this application was interesting because it used uh, FFPW for 3D Fourier transformation and the scalar pack, scalar pack for the uh, parallel density linear algebra. So most of most of performance of this application coming from the math library. So this application is good to check how much uh, how much performance you can get from the math library on the Intel system and x86 system and then. The ARM ecosystem. So we use MKL for Scarlet and KNL and the ARM PL for Syndrome 2. So I don't want to go every details of each application. So I just want to show some example of how we uh, evaluate, uh, how we compute, how we get the, how we do the performance analysis. So for HPGMG part, as I mentioned, we use two different ports. So FNMP port for CPU and CUDA port for GPU. And as you see here, we ran the multiple all possible runtime configurations or at each architecture. And then we chose the best runtime configuration uh, for, for performance, right? So we, did, we didn't just run it one, one case and then just reported it. Instead, we tested a very different combination of runtime configuration, and then we chose the best one for each architecture. And for the, for the input side, we also chose a wide range of input here. And then we chose uh, the input, which is uh, which we can run all, all the architectures, and then we could get the best performance here. So in this case, we use type Q problem for HGMG, and for other application, we did a similar approach. So testing multiple runtime configuration and using multiple input, and then we chose the common input, which which shows best performance on the architecture. The another example is QMC pack here. So QMC pack, uh, we measured uh, using this approach, we measured this data, and then we see the very big difference between Scala and Syndrix 2. And then in QMC pack case, we also have some reference data reported by others in, in, in the 2018 timeframe. But, and then we also want to cross-check what, what we are doing correct or not, right? And it turned out uh, another the data reported by other group was totally very different from us. So they reported the difference between Scala and Sundrex 2 was not 3x that much. And we, uh, we could not reproduce that smaller uh, uh, speed up between Sundrex 2 and Scala. And then we needed to do the deeper analysis what's going on to check uh, what's wrong, right? And then it turned out that we used a different version of the QM spec. So, in our study, we use the latest version of uh, QM spec, which is optimized through the SOA optimization. But the, another data was reported by the AOS uh, based approach, which is the, the previous version. And what happened here is uh, SOA has a different memory traffic because of that, it, uh, its performance bottleneck become the L1 cache bandwidth, not the memory bandwidth. Because of that, uh, we had uh, the, so we have a better performance for both case, but we could get much, much more, uh, much better performance than Scala because of the, their L1 cache bandwidth are very different to each other. So this is another example, not just running and reporting the data. We also, if possible, we also cross-checked our, our performance data with uh, other data publicly available. So after this, uh, uh, all kind of, uh, this, this kind of approach, and then we measure the uh, performance uh, result here. So, as you see here, uh, this is the per node performance, which means if you use the same number of nodes, how much performance we could get, right? So uh, as you see here, uh, HPGMG and games, the lens, we had CUDA port and COCOS port, so we could run on B100, but other application, they didn't have GPU port in 2018 timeframe, so we couldn't run it on B100, so we just focused on CPU side. So as you see here, HPGMG and the games and lens, B100 is always the, the fastest architecture we could get. 
And depending on the application, sometimes Scala is very similar to whatever we have on B100. Sometimes the Scala is even slower than KNN. So depending on the uh, application, since they have different algorithm and different, they, their performance parallax are different to each other. So we cannot easily say, oh, always uh, B100 is a three times better than the Scala or something like that, right? So based on the algorithm and the architecture, um, we have different uh, comparison. And then we um, also we were also curious about this is per node performance, but the another question is uh, each uh, each architecture uses the different uh, power usage, right? Because of that, we are curious about how much per watt performance we could we could get from each architecture for each application. So in this case, we didn't measure the the power usage. Instead, we just uh, normalized performance by the TDP thermal design power. So KNS side, we had 215 watts, Scarlet uh, 410, and the Thunderx 2, 340, and B100 250. So since the Scarlet and Thunderx 2 node use more power, I mean, more TDP, because of that, uh, when you normalize the, the performance data per power, you could see this kind of uh, situation. So, so on HPGMG part, Scarlet was slightly better than KNL, but since they use more power, per, per watt performance was less than KNL. And also difference between the KNL and the B100 becomes smaller than before, right? So this kind of thing. Um, so we can see this kind of the variation depending on what you are looking at. So how you define your performance, you know, the performance per watt, performance of load, right? And the another another thing we can we can think about is um, as we know, the B100 and Thunderx TX and then Scarlet and KNL, they have all different plot peak performance, right? They have different bandwidth, they have, they have different plot weight. So maybe just comparing performance per node is not a really great way to compare, right? So because of that, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we picked up the loop line performance model to see the loop line efficiency. So in loop line model, we have X axis, which is the elephant intensity. Oh, before moving on. Okay, so let me stop it here. Uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, yes. If you, if you look at these figures, you'll see that games and somewhat lamps are outsiders or somewhat different than others. Why, yes. is, why is that? That's, yeah, that's a really good point. So from here, uh, we see very different, uh, very different uh, uh, the, the, the behavior uh, from the others, right? So, uh, we can talk about it more in the root line analysis data. So as I mentioned, each application has different characteristics and they have different performance bottlenecks, right? So uh, in the in other cases, we could say they're they are kind of uh, determined by the memory bandwidth over plot wave, but the gains part we see more complex scenarios. So for example, it can each performance could be bother its, its performance bottleneck could be some atomic operation or some other cache, cache performance, something like, something like that, right? So that is our guess. So I don't know, uh, this is the answer for your question. <laughs> so uh, okay. there is another interesting question, I think, here. Okay. So wh why were you discussing all the systems? Mm -hmm. Is this just to, just to discuss the rationale behind the benchmarks? All these vendors, except for NVIDIA, have already designed their CPU and GPU architectures. The second decade belongs to NVIDIA, but it will not go their way in the third decade. Could you comment on that? So let me, okay, so let me try to understand the question. So the question is why we are uh, evaluating this performance comparison across the architecture? Is it the question or? Yeah, on all the systems, yeah. Yeah, so, so as you see on the, the top 500 uh, diagram, we see the multiple uh, hardware architecture uh, in, in the HPC community, right? So, and, and uh, uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we, we, we hope to run our application on, on the multiple architecture with a decent performance, right? But uh, this is kind of our early effort to understand how much decent performance you could get from uh, the different architecture without changing further optimization. So there was uh, there was one reason we are looking we, we we investigated the performance number from the different architectures with a similar source space. In this case, we we don't use exactly the same source case because we have different source 
source space for the GPU and CPU yet here. But in the next part, we have uh, uh, the, 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 the performance portability study for the same source space. I don't know if that answer for your question. Or... No, yeah, please continue. There is another question. I think the, the participants is still typing. Go ahead. Okay, Chief, please. okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so, so, okay, so since from here we have some limitations, so we wanna go a little bit deeper uh, in terms of the roof line efficiency, right? So roof line efficiency, roof line performance model is, uh, it has uh, two axes. One is uh, the arithmetic intensity, which is plot by ratio and Y axis is a uh, plot rate. And for every architecture, we have uh, uh, two loops, loop lines. One is uh, inclined loop, which is uh, which represent uh, peak memory bandwidth. And another is uh, plateau. This is the plateau, this plateau, which represent the uh, peak plot rate. And every architecture has a transition point between the peak memory bandwidth to peak, peak plot rate. So if your application or kernel's efficiency, I mean, plot load by ratio is less than this machine balance point, you can say, uh, Possibly this kernel is memory bound kernel. Otherwise, uh, that kernel can be compute bound kernel. For memory bound kernel, we have uh, we have this data. So in this case, we have the measured the plot rate, which is FRK number, and then uh, we also have measured the plot or by ratio. So using this uh, measured plot or by ratio, we can um, we can uh, estimate what could be most uh, attainable maximum most of, maximal attainable performance for this kernel. So we call this is PK number. So PK, the maximum attainable performance of kernel can be computed by the, the ping memory bandwidth multiplied by the additional intensity in this case, or for compute bound kernel, it's the peak plot rate is always the peak plot rate of the architecture. So P, P, PK number is equal to peak plot rate. And then using this FRK, measured FRK, and then projected PRK number, we can compute the efficiency, which is FRK over PK. And this single efficiency represents two features. For memory bound kernel, this roofline efficiency is equivalent to the memory bandwidth bound efficiency. For compute bound kernel, this roofline efficiency is equivalent to plot rate efficiency. And uh, we have, uh, I mean, the previous uh, the webinar about the loop line analysis, uh, we had uh, two webinars. So if you have, if you are, if you want more details, you can uh, visit these two talk in IDS, HPC, uh, BP uh, webinar, and you can, you can check more details. So in order to use the loop line, loop line uh, analysis, uh, we measured uh, the peak performance of each architecture using the empirical loop line toolkit. And then this is what we measured uh, for the KML and your Scarlet, your Sombrex 2 and B100. So as you see here, the KML has around two teraflops per second per device. And the KML has two different uh, memory uh, hierarchies. So uh, smaller, but the faster me memory, which is the MCD RAM. And uh, the larger, but slower memory, which is the DRAM. And it also has the, uh, the L1 cache here. And if you check the Scar Lake, Scar Lake was a newer architecture than the KNL in 2018. So it's the maximum flow rate is around twice more than KNL. And the DRAM bandwidth is, is much better than KNL DRAM bandwidth, but still slower than the KNL MCD RAM. And the L1 cache bandwidth is much better than the KNL L1 cache bandwidth. And when you measure the Thunderx 2, uh, because of the, the shorter vector length of the Thunderx 2 compared to Scarlet, its peak plot rate is uh, much lower than the KNL over Scarlet. It's around the one fourth of the Scarlet, right? And its memory bandwidth was slightly better than the Scarlet, but the L1 cache bandwidth is much lower than Scarlet. So in the previous discussion about the, the SOA optimization of the KMC decades, uh, the AOS, AOS performance was kind of a time of determined by, I mean, dependent is dependent on the, the memory bandwidth. So the difference was not really big, but when they have a, a SOA optimization, the performance balloting moves from the DRAM bandwidth to L1 cache bandwidth. Because of that, uh, the performance, we can we could see a very big difference between the L1 cache and the, the Scarlet and Thunderx 2. So last one is B100, which has a high supply rate, which is twice more than the Scarlet and then uh, the fastest of uh, the HBM memory, uh, and then the L1 cache performance is similar to P100 and Scarlet. 
And then using uh, this approach, we measure the performance, I mean, the loop line data per application from the Scarlet, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, KNL processor and Scarlet processor and the Thunder X2 processor. And then uh, we just normalized the, the, this loop line efficiency by the KNL to see how much variation we, we have, right? So since uh, for HPG MGFE case, uh, since uh, the Scarlet and Thunder X2 has a lower bandwidth in the memory compared to the MCD RAM, so because of that, its efficiency, and then the its efficiency is higher than Thunder X2, I mean, KNL. So as a result, uh, the uh, roof line efficiency based the comparison, the, the Thunder X2, uh, Scarlet and the Thunder X2 was much better than KNL. And in the QMC pack case, as I mentioned before, uh, the SOA optimized version has uh, uh, the L1 cache, band, cache bandwidth dependent of uh, performance, right? And, and as a result, it's a uh, DRAM based reply efficiency is much higher on the Scarlet processor, but uh, much less than on the Thunder X2. So um, this is a very quick summary. So in this study, we just tested uh, the six uh, benchmark and applications on the four different types of architecture, and we measured per node, per, per node performance and per watt performance and loop line based efficiency. And then uh, this is kind of challenge with the probability in 2018 time frame. So compared to now, we saw uh, limited demand on the probability because uh, uh, in 2018 time frame we had uh, multiple CPU vendors, which is AMD, ARM, IBM, and Intel, and so on. And in general, C, C++, Fortran with OpenMP were well supported by the most of vendors, including LBM and GNU, right? And so on CPU side, we think, oh, this is mostly portable across CPU side. And then we have another species, which is uh, the single GPGPU vendor, which is NVIDIA. We, have, we just have only one GPU vendor. And GPU side, NVIDIA GPU side, we had uh, kind of two choices. One is the CUDA for the best performance on NVIDIA architecture, but it has uh, no portability between the CPU and GPU. And the NVIDIA side, they also, we, we had also OpenACC as a portability layer between the CPU and GPU. But we had a limited number of vendors to support this, this, this model. So we had PGI, Clay, and GNU. And we also had a portability layer from HPC community, for example, Cocos and Raja. And they had OpenMP backend and CUDA backend for CPU and GPU. But uh, I think uh, in, in, in 2018 timeframe, many application developers uh, considered the CPU as the primary architecture because as I showed in at the beginning, around 82% performance came from the CPU-based system. So they consider CPU as a primary architecture, while the several developers uh, picked uh, the GPGPU for the better performance. But in this case, uh, general approach was they just create the additional branch for the GPGPU because in, the, in 2018 timeframe, you just have CPU or NVIDIA GPU, right? So it's not the perfect, but it's kind of doable to manage two different uh, branches or someone use a portability layer. And then uh, for three years since 2018, we see some changes and improvement. And now we see more demand on the portability. So in CPU side, we are same, right? So we have multiple vendors and we, we, we think uh, the portability of the CPU are fine. And GPGPU side, now we have a multiple GPGPU vendor. So in addition to NVIDIA, we have AMD and Intel. And the NVIDIA side, we still have CUDA for with limited probability and OpenACC with limited vendor support. And now we have OpenAP target offloading support for GPUs by multiple vendors. So this is the example of vendors who support the OpenAP target offloading model. We have AMD, GNU, HP, IBM, Intel, LLVM, and NVIDIA. And theoretically, uh, if you write the OpenAP target offloading model, use the OpenAP target offloading model, you can run your, your, your application on the multiple GPU system theoretically. There is some limitation, I will discuss it later. And you also have another the, the newer programming model, which is SQL, uh, led by AMD, uh, Intel initially, and HIP, which, is, which was led by AMD initially. And difference between the SQL and HIP from um, CUDA is the SQL and HIP are portable across the, the multiple GPU, GPU architecture. So we have one example in the next part. And the another change is uh, we see increased use of the portability layer from HPC community. So Cocos and Raja 
are, are extended to, to support the heap and SQL backend in addition to open and piece CUDA like uh, pre in 2018. So, uh, and then we also see more applications are uh, using the Cocos and Raja as the, their product layer across the multiple GPU system. So now we think uh, the more application developer consider GPGPU as a primary architecture. As you see in 2021 and what happened in the exascale error, we will have a more uh, performance from GPU as a system. So now people think uh, GPU could be our their primary architecture. So new, architect new challenge is uh, uh, how to make their application performance portable across the multiple GPGPU architecture. So it brings us to the next part of uh, talk, so which is performance portability study in 2021 for AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA GPU. This work is done by me, John Tran, Colvin, Yassi, Brian, Steve, and Chris Scott. So before moving on to the next part, uh, let's pause to answer some questions. Do we have any questions? Yeah, yeah. so um, there's one here. So going back to those five apps, those five benchmarks, why did you, cho why did you choose them? Uh, five different benchmarks. Six you mean the previous benchmark here? Yes. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, we we wanted to have some uh, real application or some proxy application to represent our uh, ECT or DOE uh, workload. So we cannot choose everything, but uh, we want to uh, move beyond uh, some micro benchmark benchmarking uh, comparison. So. Um, yeah, that, that's one reason. And uh, those applications are kind of, uh, these four applications are important applications used on the, our ARCF system. And also this HPG MG neckbone is a good, good proxy to represent uh, to some CFD and uh, continuum mechanics based uh, the applications it is why we chose them. So yes, I think in summary is that some of these applications take most of the cycles in the DOE systems, right? Which is the case yep. for uh, electronic structure calculations, for example. Yep. Uh, let me, there is another question here. It's a long mm -hmm. one. So let's see. Um, I, I may have missed this. Uh, was a unified programming model compiler used for the benchmarks like uh, OpenACC, OpenCL? I think you comment on that. Yeah, so in this study, we use OpenMP for CPUs and CUDA for GPU, uh, GPU part, uh, and also the COCOS on the GPU part. So uh, we didn't, uh, yeah, that, that's what we used. So uh, for the same application, we didn't use the so same source space for CPU and GPU yet in this study because it was not available uh, for every application or application. So. Uh, but yeah, there is a choice of uh, programming model we use in this study. Yes, uh, go, please move, go on. Uh, there are a few other questions here, but I'll, let's wait until the end. Okay. Okay, so next part is uh, performance portability study done in 2018. So why performance portability on GPUs? So as I mentioned before, uh, by moving, uh, I mean, moving into the XSK error, we are expecting more accelerated basis system, right? So acceler accelerator basis systems are one of dominant uh, design in exascale. So we are going to have a new NVIDIA GPU system, which is Perlmutter, Riorado, and Polaris. And also we are expecting new Intel GPU basis system, Aurora Argon, and uh, Argon Aurora, and the uh, Supermug phase two, and new AMD GPU system, which is Frontier, uh, Capitan, and Lumi system. So it is very challenging, we think, for developers to make their application portable across HPC, these uh, GPU-based HPC systems. And USDOE has supported 21 projects with more than a dozen, three dozens of applications for coming exascale a system through the ECP, the exascale computing project. So we want to know what, what, what is the best way to assess the application performance across the system. So in this study, we investigated performance portability of subset of ECP applications and related linear apps across AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA GPUs. So this is employ, employed the GPU system in 2021. So um, all, of them, sir, all of them were publicly available in 2021 timeframe. So we chose AMD MI100 GPU, uh, and which is a very powerful discrete GPU. And for Intel side, we use Intel Gen 9 GPU. It was a little bit outdated GPU uh, since uh, Intel uh, XE discrete GPU uh, was not, were not available, publicly available yet. So we 
uh, choose this GPU as the proxy GPU for Intel, but it's a subsystem, for example, subslice and the EU architecture has some, some similarity to the Intel, uh, the XE uh, discrete GPU system. So it was good proxy. And uh, from NVIDIA side, uh, we chose a NVIDIA A100 GPU, it, it, one of the most powerful GPU in 2021 timeframe. So yeah, again, the Intel XE brand uh, is not publicly available. So in this study, we chose, um, uh, we, we picked up the Intel Gen 9 GPU as a proxy GPU for Intel uh, GPU, GPU ecosystem. Uh, ECT applications, uh, we use, we, we use the three ECT applications for this study. So AMR Wind, uh, which is from the uh, ECT Exa Wind project. And uh, this application uses AMR UX framework as the probability layer. And the HEP application from the ECT Exa Sky project. Uh, so the, the CUDA code, uh, we, uh, the, the project has originally has CUDA code and that CUDA code was migrated uh, to the SQL, SQL model through the, using the Intel DPCT compatibility tool. And then in this study, we just use a SQL port for three different GPUs. So we tested the SQL based uh, hack on the Intel and NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. SW4 is another ECT application from EQSIM project. And SW4 uses the Raja portability layers uh, uh, for Intel and NVIDIA and AMD GPU. So we use that, that implementation. And we use a three ECT uh, proxy application. So ECP uh, Games are like the mini app, which is from the Games project. And uh, this mini app is implemented. Uh, it, it, this, this mini app uses OpenMP target offloading model for three different GPUs. And XS Bench is another benchmark from OpenMC application, which is from ECP and XS SMR project. And XS Bench has multiple uh, port for to program models, but in this study, we we, we picked up the OpenMP target uploading model uh, to check the performance portability. The last mini app is a test net, which is from uh, LAMS application from the XSORT project. And again, the test lab also has a multiple port for two program models, but in this study, we just use the co-host implementation to check the performance portability. And this is our first result. So we just built uh, them. Uh, so using the same source, source code, right? Same source, source, source port, and then we uh, build, uh, we built and then ran the applications on three different GPU system and we could run it without changing the code. So yeah, uh, all the portal portability layers, uh, which is a SQL model, OpenMP target following model, Focus and Raja and AMRX framework, all of them works uh, successfully. <laughs> so we could get all the green light, green light uh, from the early application, which is great. And then we moved on the performance portability uh, evaluation. So there are several ways to measure the performance portability. In this study, we picked up the John Panicook's uh, performance portability metric, PPM. PPM is a harmonic mean of efficiency. So PPM is a good metric to represent uh, overall efficiency across the setup platform. In this case, uh, Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA GPU platforms. And the original paper, there were two recommendations for the efficiency. So uh, architecture efficiency, which is the uh, cheap performance as a fraction of the peak hardware performance. And also we can use uh, application efficiency, which is the uh, cheap performance as a fraction of the best observed performance based on the most optimized implementation. And we try to use them, but we realize uh, it is challenging to use uh, those efficiency directly. So the reason is uh, for architecture efficiency, we may use the peak plot rate as uh, for architecture efficiency, but it will be very restricted because from our previous study in 2018, from the roofline analysis, we, we saw uh, a lot of corners are not just the plot compute bound, right? So we saw several corners are memory bound. So if you just use peak plot rate for the memory bound kernel, that efficiency could be too low. So it is too restrictive. Um, the, the, the standard, right? And we may, uh, do, we, may we may select several different components for the architecture efficiency, but in this case, uh, before measuring the efficiency, we have to identify what is the major performance bottleneck for the all different cases, all application, all different architecture. So that, that requires a lot of uh, in-depth performance analysis. So we, 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 we felt that maybe too heavy at the beginning. The last one is, uh, for application efficiency, 
uh, we should we need to implement the fully optimized kernel for each hardware platform. Uh, if we use a mini micro benchmark, we can do that. But for real application and, and the large number of applications, it's not doable. So uh, the reason we are using portability layer is to avoid this situation, right? So this approach is not a uh, kind of doable thing we can do in this study. So uh, in this study, we decided to use roofline efficiency as an approximation of the architectural efficiency. So if you use that, we can say the corners are highly performance portable if they fully utilize peak memory bandwidth over peak plot rate. So it's obviously better than using the peak plot rate, one index. But still, we may miss the, some, some other performance bottleneck, right? So, so through this process, we can identify some corners which has a low roofline efficiency. And then we can, we can check them as uh, that require some further invest investigation for performance portability, right? So for example, um, memory latency dependent uh, critical or something like that. So we can, so we can, we can uh, consider some additional index analysis for those corners. And obviously it does not require any uh, optimized kernel uh, implementation for each architecture. So it is a big plus uh, for, for us. So again, uh, before moving on, we measured uh, the, the hardware, uh, the peak, peak uh, performance using the empirical fine toolkit on uh, Intel and AMD and NVIDIA GPU. And this is the result. So as you see, MI100 and A100, both of them are very powerful discrete GPU using very high power. So they have very high plot rate and similar to each other. And both of them use um, HBM2 to memory, even though they have some, some different number of stacks, but overall we can say, oh, they're, a very fast memory and similar to each other, right? Intel side, as I mentioned, uh, we use Intel Gen 9 GPU, which is uh, integrated GPU with a very small power usage. Because of that, its peak plot rate is much lower than others, and the peak memory bandwidth is much lower than others. But in this study, uh, we decided to use uh, roofline efficiency. So uh, at the end, uh, we, we think uh, that the, the efficiency wise difference cannot be that big enough. That, that much. So for loop analysis, we needed to use um, the performance uh, tool. So we need to measure some, some plot count and memory trap, et cetera. So we need to use a different profiling tool from different vendors. So Intel side, we use Intel Advisor. So Intel Advisor has supported GPU loop line feature for several years and a couple of years now. And it used a uh, binary instrumentation tool, which is called GTP because of that, each overhead is relatively higher than using the hardware performance counters. NVIDIA Insight uh, started providing the roofline feature uh, since last year, I think, and uh, it supports the CUDA and OpenMP target offering model. But for some reason, uh, we, we can run the OpenCL application on NVIDIA GPU, but we cannot measure performance data for OpenCL uh, based models. It's kind of weird to me, but. Uh, because of that, at the beginning of this, this, this uh, study, we had uh, some possible open CI application, but we could not include, include that application here. So we hope in media tool will support open CI program models soon. And the Rockham Profiler. Um, Rockham Profiler is a very nice, lightweight uh, the tool to collect uh, performance data from hardware counters and drive the metric. Uh, MI100 GPU does not have a, a full set of the counters for PLOP. So plot cannot be measured by one or two performance counter in this combination of the multiple counters. Because of that, uh, because, because it doesn't have the full set of the counters, so we cannot, we couldn't measure the plot count uh, from the uh, MI100 GPU. So in this study, we assume the plot count on MI100 are similar to plot count on A100 because of their similar uh, discrete GPU. Uh, and then uh, we hope the next generation of AMD GPU will have better situation. And I, and I see the MI250 uh, AMD has a different, different story. So we, we can expect better. And this is an example of uh, uh, what, how, we, how we process the, the performance data on, on, on multiple GPUs. So this is an example of AMR, AMR Win. So AMR Win is CCP application. So we have a lot of different kernels. Uh, so this is uh, the screenshot from the Intel Advisor. And after running that, we chose the most time-consuming corners because we cannot process everything for this study. So we chose the three different corners, which is uh, MLA back Laplace and F-smooth kernel, ML Plus and F-smooth kernel, and ML Node Laplace and F-smooth kernel. 
And then uh, using the advisor, we measure the flower by ratio and uh, the plot weight, and then the PK, which is the maximum attainable performance. For the same kernel, we measure the same data on the A1, A100, A100 GPU, like this one. And MI100, we measure the data traffic from the Rockham Rock profiler, and we, we use the plot count from A100, and then we, we could estimate the uh, uh, plot or by ratio and the plot rating here. So using similar approach, uh, we measure the all the roofline data on the three different architecture. So as you see here, mostly the corners are located close to rooflines in here. And the NVIDIA side, we have also see some consistent pattern here. And the MI100 side, we have a little bit more scattered uh, data pattern here. The, the reason we, we, we guess is, um, as I mentioned, the MI100, the plot count was not actually measured on the MI100. That could be one reason we have some kind of big deviation. And also the, we see uh, AMD uh, as SDK has, uh, has, has, has evolved very, very quickly. So um, over time, uh, we, we, we expect uh, AMD side, we, we could have the better, better efficiency. So uh, anyway, this is what we measured or what we estimated. And then um, this is, uh, uh, roofline efficiency, um, I mean, from the, each kernel of the applications. And then if you just uh, do the some average value of the uh, efficiency, we see Gen 9 has a 56% and A100, MI100 around 40%. So we cannot say from this number, we cannot say the Intel is better GPU than them because Intel Gen 9 is much smaller GPU than other GPU in this study. So we are running same workload on, the, on, on, on different GPUs because of that. Intel has a better chance to get the higher occupancy or et cetera, right? So, so yeah, that, that could be the reason. So we don't, yeah, we don't put a lot of pressure on here. Okay, and using the, the roofline efficiency computed from a measured or estimated from 3D GPU, and we, we computed the PPM, performance probability metric, and using the harmonic mean, right? So, and then, uh, we, we see the PPM is good metric. So for example, uh, if you look at the hack geometry kernel, its PPM number is 68%. As you see here, uh, from three different, different architecture, its roof line efficiency is really high, right? And another case, if you look at the, the games arrived to mini app, we see the efficiency on three different GPU are relatively lower than others and also has big variation, right? So, and then if you just check the PPM number, Geometric corner is 68% PPM and the RM2 mini F has 9% PPM. So using PPM number, we can easily check, oh, this kernel is more performance portable in terms of roofline efficiency than this kernel, right? So in this aspect, PPM is good metric to, to see this information. And then we clustered uh, those corners in terms of the PPM number. So we just made the three cluster. So first cluster is a uh, uh, high PPM number. So more than 60%. So uh, for this kernel, we can say, oh, they are mostly performance portable in terms of uh, the roofline efficiency, right? For middle PPM cluster, we have a big, big uh, variation here. And then we can say, oh, some are performance portable in terms of roofline efficiency. And uh, there's some possibility to get the benefit from further investigation, right? So this kind of uh, gray area here. And the last, Last group is a low PPM uh, cluster, which has a very low uh, roofline efficiency across the three different GPUs. So we can say uh, they are less performance portable based on roofline efficiency, which means uh, their performance are not, uh, I mean, their performance parallax are not memory bandwidth or, or plot base, something else, right? So for this group of um, corners, uh, we need to uh, do more investigation to identify the critical bottleneck. For example, it could be memory latency, cache performance, or alternative operation, or instruction throughput, whatever, right? So for this group of uh, corners, uh, it requires some additional index of performance analysis to uh, identify the performance bottleneck. So, um, so here, uh, there's another, another observation we made. So PPM number is to is good metric to represent uh, performance efficiency, but uh, in some case here, so we chose uh, ML, uh, AML wind, ML node kernel, which is 35% PPM, and also access bench kernel is 33% 30, PPM. They are similar to each other, right? 
Uh, but if you look at the variation here, the AMR win has very little variation and the excess bench has very large variation, right? So depending on audience, we may have some different answer for this question. So can you say both corners are similarly performance portable or not? So someone say, someone may say yes, or someone may say no. Actually, we, we saw different <laughs> responses from our colleague as well. So for someone who don't think they are similarly performance portable, I, we think uh, additional metric uh, could be helpful to understand the consistency in uh, of, of the performance, right? Performance consistency. So what we did here is um, we just uh, tried additional metric for performance consistency, which is um, can be standard deviation of average or mean or max ratio. So in this study, we just had the three samples per applications, right? So mean or max ratio could be good consistent consistent metric. But if you have a more set, for example, 10 or 20 sets, maybe mean or max ratio can be polluted by the outliers, right? So in this case, we had better use the standard deviation over average approach, right? So using this uh, consistency metric uh, uh, for this corner with the same PPM number, we have uh, uh, different consistent metrics. So if you look at the mean or max ratio for the AML win case, it is a 90%, which means uh, highly consistent each other. And excess bench case, it is a 37%, which is not really highly consistent with each other. So we can expect uh, on excess bench, we have we, we can we can expect more variation across the system, right? And I think this is the last part of this, this talk. I mean, so we also check, try to see the productivity and uh, uh, portability layer works as an aid to productivity of the application because uh, it, can reduce or eliminate the need for multiple code branches for multiple uh, platforms. So it's obviously positive in productivity, but we also see some challenges uh, even with the portability layer, nice portability layer. So uh, one, one observation is uh, architectural difference may result in the multiple branches of code. For example, Cocos is portable across CPU and GPU, but what we see in the test lab is test lab has independent code branches for CPU and GPU. The reason is, GPU branch increase the number of clocks with avoiding global memory read and write. So it ends up being a net benefit for the GPU platform. So this kind of the architecture difference can uh, make people to consider some additional branches, right? So this is kind of, uh, kind of plus and cons of the, uh, in, in, in terms of productivity. And the other thing is, uh, some partially implemented uh, program model specification across the different platforms. So OpenMP target uploading model and SQL implemented specifications are open standard, but it does not mean all specifications are implemented at the same time by all the compilers, right? Because of that reason, uh, developers need to understand what kind of common set are supported by the multiple compilers or multiple implementations, right? And then. Uh, in order to keep the, their portability, they have to use that common set instead of using some spec some specification from in the corner cases, right? So this is kind of uh, we think this is kind of temporary issue, but uh, I mean our compiler implementer quickly uh, cover increased the coverage of the specification, but uh, that is what we have now. So uh, developers need to understand the situation. Last thing is uh, further optimization. So as I showed in the architecture difference, different difference make some additional branches. So uh, to in order to get the best performance on specific architecture or specific platform, um, people may consider to make some additional branches the best performance, right? And then that just ruined the productivity. And also uh, the performance tools interface are different from the vendor. So you need some uh, patient, patience to learn the, how to use them. So yeah, and uh, this is a lesson we learned. So uh, thanks to well-developed portability layer, SQL, open API target offloading model, Raja, Focus, AMR, AMREX framework, all application mini apps uh, ran successfully on three different GPU system. And uh, getting performance data was kind of challenging. It's not impossible, but it was changing. So, uh, so we need to uh, be patient about, uh, about them. Uh, to 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 learn how to use how to collect those data, and uh, estimating performance efficiency was challenging. So we used root efficiency, and then uh, we could identify what which corners are memory bound or compute bound corner easily. And then we also have some kind of third party which is not bound by compute memory bandwidth or compute uh, plot rate. So for those corners, uh, 
uh, we can we can put the mark for the further performance investigation. And we also suggest uh, the, we suggest the performance consistency in addition to performance portability metric uh, to check uh, the the performance variation across the architecture. And we have some observation on performance uh, productivity people, which I discussed uh, in the previous slide. So uh, this support, uh, uh, this work was done by the ASCF uh, uh, and the BOE support and the uh, Exascale computing project support. And we also used the uh, JLC system at the R1 uh, National Lab for using the multiple architecture. And uh, we appreciate our uh, uh, collaborator. So we have a voluntarily uh, working group with called the uh, PMA, Performance Models and Architectures at the Argonne National uh, Laboratory. Uh, so Abhishek and Kevin and Ye and Vitaly and Chris and Bryce, they are not authors of this, this, uh, this talk, but they, uh, they provided their technical feedback uh, in regular basis. So we appreciate their, their support. And the Sam Williams and Jakar for uh, the collaboration with, uh, for the loop line model discussion and John, Paul and Wei Kin for technical support for AMI Wind and AMI Rex. And Rahul and Daniel for discussing about the test net result, and then Christian and David for discussing some other performance bottleneck on the GPU side. So, yeah, this is all I have. Uh, any question? Thank you, Jayuk. Yes, we have some questions here. So let's uh, see what we have in the chat. So just the participants, uh, everything that came in here through the chat under the uh, Google Doc. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll ask Jayuk to go through uh, and and answer. Uh, and then we'll, we'll send it to everybody that joined us today, the, the answer. Okay. So were any, uh, so then going back to the, the questions here, were any of these test codes written in Fortran, Jay Uh That's that's a good question. Um, in, this, in, this, in this set of the application, we didn't use any Fortran port. So in the previous, uh, the, the, uh, the part in 2018, the games uh, was written in Portugal for the CPU part, right? And I, I, I know the games, games team is uh, diligently working on upholding the Portugal code uh, for GPU now, but unfortunately we couldn't test it in this study, no. All right, another question here. Let's say that a code is benchmarked as a point in, on the roof line plot. Mm -hmm. When the same code runs on a different machine, with mm. the, will the coordinates of the point change on the roof line plot? Yes, that's that's a, that's a really good question. So, uh, I I mean theoretically we thought at the beginning uh, we measure if we measure the so in the roof line plot there is there are two two components are important important right one is the plot count another is the data traffic right so for plot count for data traffic obviously data they have different data traffic because each gpu system has different size of cache right for example if some gpu has very small l1 cache and then now in this this, this root line data everything is measured from the dram traffic based one so if some application some gpu has very small l1 traffic that means it can have a more dram traffic right if some gpu has a very large l1 l1 cache or l2 cache that means DRAM traffic can be reduced, right? Because of that, data traffic can be very different between the architecture. So that is uh, something we expected. The another part, at the beginning, we thought, oh, plot count could, could not change because we are using exactly the same source, source space, right? So every case, we use the same source, source, source case. And then we, we thought uh, the plot count should be exactly the same, but it was not true. The reason is we don't just use plus and Plus, and uh, we, we, don't, we don't just use add and the multiplication, right? We have also used uh, some math function, and the math function uh, can be differently implemented on different architecture. So, for example, the inverse function can have different number of plots for the architecture based on this, the, the assembly, right? So, because of that reason, uh, even the plot count or can also change between the different architectures. So, yes. So. Short answer is yes, uh, depending on the architecture, your European data can be moved and left and right. Uh, let's see, another question here. Besides uh, GPUs, are there mm -hmm. any other are, are there any other accelerators going to uh, go into XA scale systems? In my, in my understanding, right now the XSK systems are using GPUs, right? So that's my understanding. I hope to have a more, but yeah, that, that's my understanding. Yeah. Um, 
will another question will get will we get flop counts from AMG tools anytime soon uh yeah so actually uh on the ECP uh, uh annual meeting happening in May uh, uh we will have uh, the roofline uh, tutorial for Intel AMD and Nvidia GPU side and I know the AMD uh, will present a new approach how to process the roofline data. And in, in, in that tutorial, you will see more details how to measure the flop count from a, uh, MI, uh, the, the AMD GPUs. Yeah. So, yes, in so, new generation, they have a better, better way to measure. Yeah. So, another, uh, I think uh, the last and short question here. There are longer questions at the top here, the, the Google Doc. But as I said before, uh, Jayuk will answer those in writing and we'll send it to everybody later. Okay, okay. so here, uh, where do you see standard language features playing a role in performance portability for heterogeneous, heterogeneous systems? So, okay, let me try to understand the question. So the question is, uh, I mean, the, some newer approach from NVIDIA, the ISO compiler approach. Is it is, is question not, not using some other portability layer? I think that's uh, yeah, that's in that direction, yes. Okay, so I, I saw a very nice presentation uh, on, through during the GTC about the ISO language uh, for C support for the accelerator, which is a really nice feature. Uh, and I hope to try it out uh, in, in real time, but the one of the things is uh, even for the very optimal uh, programming model, uh, we need to have uh, multiple supporters, right? So if only one vendor supports that programming model, for, for, for best model, for optimal model, if you don't have a multiple supporter, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many application developer will pick up that approach quickly, right? So it, 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 it's related to some sustainability, right? So, uh, if you have uh, more vendors are supporting that feature, and I believe uh, more developers will, will, will start using those features, and then, yeah, so that'll be great to see, but we'll see what's, how it goes. Well, I had said that was going to be the last one, but here there, there is another that I think is interesting and useful okay. for this. Uh, what kind of analysis profiling tools do you think will be helpful for HPC developers to improve performance portability? So, in, as, uh, so as we present in this talk, the so roofline performance analysis could be one of the approach to identify your corner star memory bound or the compute bound, right? But again, as I told you before, the roofline performance data cannot capture everything, uh, every performance bottleneck, right? So, so I suggest to use the roofline performance tool as a, as a first step of a performance analysis. After doing that, if your corners are not bound by memory bandwidth or cloud weight, uh, you need to go to deeper analysis, which is uh, you may need to check what, how much instruction, instruction throughput you have in the kernel or how much cache bandwidth you're utilizing or how many cache heat or miss ratio you have, right? So those kind of additional uh, in-depth analysis are required. But as a first step, I think uh, root analysis could be a, a, a good approach to start. All right. Okay. So thank you all for joining. Thank you, Jehuk. Uh, I was just... Uh...